All right, welcome to the Media Roundtable Special Edition, where we're diving deep into the inner workings of the audio industry in service of the chief audio officer. Who is the chief audio officer? That is the person who is responsible for the success of an audio program on behalf of a brand. And it is a narrow lane, but a, a very important consequential lane. Um, and that's one of the things we love about podcasts is you can go deep. Uh, even if you're only talking to a few thousand people, this is important stuff. I'm your host, Dan Granger, and co-hosting with me today is one of the leading minds in our field, Neil Lucy, who's our EVP of strategy at Oxford Road. Um, we're, we're getting back to our roots a little bit today, because uh, if you've listened in the last year to a lot of what you hear on the media roundtable, is us just talking about industry news and what does this mean to you? And there's a lot of that. There's always a lot of that. Um, but today we're not we're not talking Joe Rogan. We're not talking Super Bowl. We're going to go deep on the reason that we started this podcast to begin with. For those of you that go back to 2020 with us, uh, we found ourselves in a very confused environment. Um, everybody was arguing about everything. People were unclear about what to say and certainly what to sponsor. And I think a lot of the conversation over the years has transitioned to this notion of brand safety and suitability, which is important so that marketers don't get in trouble with their bosses. But that's like the worst case scenario. It actually is touching on something that has much deeper, um, larger consequences for all of us and actually for democracy. And that's why this is actually an important discussion. And it's important that we revisit it from time to time. Uh, all the rules are changing. Uh, we we started, uh, most of us were born into a world where the FCC actually had some involvement in the things that could reach your eyes and ears. Uh, but all of that has changed. And uh, so, so there was an article that Neil shared with me a, a couple of months back titled A Matter of Trust. And I think that that is a really succinct way of representing the 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 place that our democracy is in that the state of our communications is in that that our culture is in trust is something that is depreciating um, rapidly in all areas whether you look at government or uh, you're looking at uh, NGOs um, if you're if you're talking about media it's no different we've been on a steady decline for the last half of a century and there gets to be a point where things start to break in real life, and we may be in that place now. And so we, we've we invited the author of that article, who is really touching on some of these themes in a well-researched way, um, to to share his perspectives on, on the state of things and, and where it's going and what we can do about it. That's what we're going to talk about today. His name is Evan Shapiro. I'm just going to give a little background on Evan. Um which is hard to do because he's been so prolific in the media space. He is the owner and cartographer, one of the few cartographers mo anybody knows, uh, at a company called eShap, which is uh, his media war and peace uh, is a must read newsletter uh, in, in if you work in any part of media, not specific to audio, we urge you to check it out. He's a uh, adjunct professor at NYU uh, Stern School of Business. Uh, he is a former EVP at NBC Universal Media, former president of IFC, and if you, like me, appreciate Portlandia, uh, we all owe Evan a, a, a debt of gratitude for his involvement there. Uh, and, and in 2020, uh, Deadline published his first media universe map, and it was a really unique way of looking at the industry. Um, that it was immediately adopt adopted by businesses and executives and analysts and universities. Uh, and he's really become an unofficial ambassador for uh, the map of media as we're trying to understand it today, which is ever more confusing. So, um, Evan, I don't know if we missed anything in that, but I just want to say thank you and welcome to the Media Roundtable. We're really grateful to have you here. Well, that was very thorough. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so uh, Neil, I'm going to let you kick off the discussion because uh, uh, this was your idea anyway. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> where where, where should we where should we your start? Fault. Where should we start? Oh, uh, why don't I start with? Uh, I'm always trying to find information to share with our audience uh, through either the influencer newsletter or through the media roundtable industry edition, and. 
I guess I stumbled across Evan's newsletter uh, and I, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is pretty amazing. So uh, I not only stumbled across it, but now I'm subscribed and I'm paying for it. So nice. <laughs> and it, and, and it's your funnel is working. It's definitely worth it. So you should pay for it and support Evan's work because it's amazing. So what piqued my interest was the newsletter, A Matter of Trust, and really just seeing how how we flipped basically from the 1970s, where basically 70% of the U.S. Popular, population trusted the news media. And now here we are, or here we were, and probably even worse today in 2023, where 70% of Americans distrust the media. So uh, I brought it to Dan's attention because I think it's important for us as an agency and it's an area that we we really want to encourage civil discourse and we want to uh, encourage uh, the sharing of opinions. Um, we should be able to talk about differences in, in, in a way that um, doesn't mean that we disrespect other people, but we have differences. And, and if we don't do that, then, you know, where are we going to go as a country? So uh, that's what brought us here. And I think, Evan, I just want to understand from your perspective, I guess, what made you write this piece? And what do you what do you think? What is your perspective on this rising distrust in media? I mean, you do a really thorough job in the in the in the newsletter, but love to hear from from your perspective. Yeah, I find, I mean, you know, as a, as a child of the 70s, um, I found it interesting that the peak of trust for news for Americans in our media was 1976, which is after 74, 76, right after uh, the news industry brought down a president and then eventually ended the Vietnam War. Um, and you know, to have gone from that, which is the earliest kind of picture I had about the media, it was the thing, all the president's man, you know, whatever. It was the thing that that changed the 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 nation's mind uh, about all this stuff. And then, as I taught, um, as I taught uh, at NYU, I also taught teach at Fordham. Um, you know, I had to kind of explain what's happened to media <laughs> over the last 35 to 40 years. And, and the class I teach is really um, a course of uh, following media's evolution in real time. So we, we talk each week about what's happening in media. And that, the map was actually born from a need to be able to say, here it is shifting in real time, right? Um, little did I know I was giving myself um, the task of re updating this map twice a month in PowerPoint by hand which is really painful. <laughs> um, but that 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 pursuit of what what was happening um, was uh, was really important. And one of the things that that I kind of um, fell upon by accident was that in do you know what was the number one show in 1972 mm -hmm. in the United States? The number one television show? I can guess. All in the family. I don't know. All in the family. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know how many people watched that 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 television show all at the same time every single all, week? All of them. I think. <laughs> 67 million people. Yeah. A week. Every week for yeah. 22 weeks. Yeah. And if you remember that show, Meathead and Archie coexisted in a world. They didn't have their own set of facts. They didn't have their own little information bubbles. They they talked to each other. And Walter Cronkite was the most trusted. Uh, name and news. And by the way, if you went to radio, right, um, the local DJ on whether it was the the news station or the rock station um, was was the most important uh, name in in audio in that in that region at that given time. And 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 very often there were national audio broadcasts that held enormous amount uh, of sway. I mean, look at just Casey Kasem uh, and and as as a, a source of universal truth. <laughs> he's the guy who's going to tell you what the most important songs of the, of, of the week are every single week. So I uh, uh, I stumbled upon that as a case study of uh, the disintegration. And and, I, and when I first started 15, uh, teaching 15 years ago, I was comparing that against, you know, 30, 40 million, 20 million, lower and lower every single year. 
And as the fragmentation of media took over in the, in the marketplace, and, and I begin to teach that um, in the course, suddenly you realize that Meathead and Archie were no longer talking to each other, that uh, Meathead had MSNBC and Archie had Fox, or um, uh, uh, Archie had Rush Limbaugh and conservative talk radio, and literally the liberals had nobody. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, jazz, um, and um, and and you know to a certain extent you could point to media's disintegration as the cause of the polarization. Um, and as you chart here, I'll I'll pull this up um, uh, so we can all look at it. Um, when you chart this, you can see um, actually things happen in the cult larger culture. So in 1987, Reagan's uh, administration kills the fairness doctrine. And suddenly certain rules about broadcast uh, on radio and television change about at fair time and showing, uh, you know, facts and not specifically opinion or, you know, what verges on libel. Um, and then, you know, you know, very soon after that, you see the birth of uh, the talk radio uh, with Rush uh, Limbaugh and um, the uh, the creation of Fox News, but it really becomes the the launch of social media um, around the the early part of this century, where the confirmation bias bubbles cement. Um, you know the 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 ability to attract people to the worst versions of themselves quickly um, took hold and really separated the country into two different sets of facts or multiple sets of facts. And this just became an obsession of mine. Uh, as I, the more I taught, the more I became focused on it. The, the lack of a common hearth, the lack of a common language, um, the lack of a common joke to tell around the water cooler after having watched on the family the night before was really, um, I think not just a symptom. <laughs> I think it, it was, it is one of the great reasons why um, we don't find ourselves as, as able to disagree and continue to make progress as we once were. Certainly you go to Europe and even in a fragmented ecosystem, the BBC and public service media in most countries, um, don't they don't serve as the voice of the government, which I think a lot of Americans have painted public service media as. They serve as a universal source of um, uh, un, uh, unbiased truth. Do they make mistakes? Absolutely. But Americans don't have anything close to that. And I think it's it's one of the reasons we are we are in a political shitstorm, cultural shitstorm the way that we are. So before we uh, talk more about the decline, um, do you see that there was a benefit simultaneous to this through the the doing away with the fairness doctrine or the fragmentation through social media? What is there a, is there a benefit that has made any of this trade worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the benefit to to um, I mean, I mean, it's a kind of a universal benefit of there is no longer one norm. Mm -hmm. I mean, 1972, um, you know, Walter Cronkite was the most trusted name in news. Uh, everyone watched Archie and Meathead and, 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 you know, frankly, Maud broadcast two episodes about her having an abortion in 1973. And a year later, abortion uh, was legal. These two things are not divorced. On the flip side of that, there was only Maud <laughs> on TV. Right. There were right. three choices. <laughs> it was a very monolithic white um, you know, very specific, wealthy point of view that be was baked into all media. Um, you know, and, and if a, a brown person came along and became popular, they were co-opted uh, almost uh, immediately. Um, that said, Flip Wilson had a, a top uh, 10 show in, in 1974 as well. Um, so, um, you know, we were making progress, but it was a, it was very beneficial to a white patriarchy um, at the time. Now we have a system that has many more points of view involved in it. You know, frankly, a show like Portlandia would never have been made in 1980, 1990, even. Even 2000, it, would, it, got, it was very hard to get that show made. It, it wasn't until, you know, Netflix could help turn it into a, a hit. 
Um, and so, yes, um, it became very, it, the, the reason why um, there is so much good TV to watch is because uh, it doesn't need to have 60 million people watching it every week in order to be deemed a hit. So you can be more niche and super serve more, more uh, interests and more points of view. Um, um, so there are, uh, and then within social media, the ability to find one's tribe, um, whether you're trans or a young uh, person of color or uh, a, a, a Muslim who lives in the United States right now, what well, that, must that be like at this, this moment in time, or Jews um, trying to find a way to stop uh, uh, anti-Semitism in our culture, you can congregate online in ways that you could never before. You can collaborate online in ways that you couldn't before. Um, but just like if we had cars driving the nation without roads or without yellow lines in the middle of the streets or without speed limits or without seatbelts, we, yeah. first of all, we took the guardrails off with the fairness yeah. doctrine. Um, and then we failed to regulate anything forever. Um, there was some little regulation in the, in the nineties around the internet. Um, to this day, there are zero guardrails on uh, Meta or YouTube or Roblox, for that matter, um, uh, or any of the social media platforms with regards to content moderation. Um, they're not held responsible when a beheading is live streamed last week. Last week. This happened last week. Yeah. So like, there's not, there's no consequences for these, sorry, motherfuckers. There's just not zero. Yeah. Um, Meta gets caught uh, inflating its uh, video views by a factor of two X. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Everyone knows that Google and Meta are selling fraud most of the time. <laughs> and yet they control between them somewhere around 50% of the world's advertising those two companies and not 50% of digital advertising, 50% of advertising. Yeah. So in a way, so the, the upshot is that we were able to provide a platform and a real town square, public square for the free 100%. and open exchange of ideas. So everybody now can be represented. But the problem is we, we went from, uh, nothing but rules to no rules and now we have chaos yeah i mean we we handed out guns and cigarettes guns cigarettes and beer to a bunch of six-year-olds in kindergarten now we're under we can't understand why everybody's laying around dead right right now for, for literally people... i mean let's 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 yeah. translate this into the the terrible mental health ecosystem that is instagram the misinformation that everybody's going crazy about on tiktok like what did you think was going to happen what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. 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 Well, and I think we're all feeling it. So sorry, Neil, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we can jump to, I mean, we're, cause we've, we started talking about it, the social media aspect. Right. And I mean, you talk about the, like, I mean, you see in that, in that chart, the advent of social media, I mean, Trust in media kind of held on pretty well. I mean, it was declining over time, but it it held on. All things, all things considered, given the Fox News of it all, the pro remember Fox News pre existed, uh, uh, um, uh, social media to a certain yeah. extent, and and yeah, no, I think look, especially like after look what happened after Bush Gore. That's what, what? Find, I find fascinating is that despite the fact that I fucking hated the outcome, I trusted the press. Like I trusted that what they were telling me for the most part. And you can see trust goes up and then social media comes along and says, not so fast democracy. And it really just pulls everybody into their corners and never to emerge, to never emerge. Yeah. You one thing I want to stuck in these corners. I, I want to mention, which I, I thought fascinating because I feel like there is this uh, perception that the liberal news media Right. And and so by kind of releasing releasing the uh, restrictions of the fairness doctrine, um, it allowed for kind of more conservative voices to be heard. But what's interesting is if you look at the the Gallup trust, the the trust in the media has nosedived among Republicans. Yeah. And it's it's actually well, held up reasonably well among Democrats. So I was wondering, like, if 
if part of the reason for kind of these changes was to allow kind of more voices to be heard, why why are why is the Repub like the if you consider yourself Republican, you now are at like eleven percent trust in the media. Well, the, the, the like the, Democrats, it's like fifty eight percent. Yeah, I mean, the, the other voice that was allowed to be heard over the last uh, 30 years is is the is the conservative side. So we have to zoom and, and we I think we often fail as a culture to do this as much as well, I, we fail to do this because we have such short attention spans and we don't think like anything that sounds like learning. But if you zoom out, the 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 what what people mean when they say liberal media is the same thing they they mean when they say liberal democracy. And liberal democracy is not a political term. Um, it is a it is a uh, uh, it is a uh, governmental term. It is a form of government, like communism. Well, I think it depends on who's saying it. But like it, fascism it could, could be, yeah, right. But no, in the grand scheme yeah. of of the yeah. political spectrum, that yeah. during during World War II, the battle was between liberal democracies and fascists. Yeah. So that, that was the battle. It was the good guys versus the bad guys, right? Meaning democracies, but liberal democracies, which mean basically to in technical terms, one person, one vote. And and, the, and what will happen is when you, when you hear real kind of manipulative right wingers, they're not not all right wingers are are very manipulative, but there are some who are very good at manipulating language. Um, um, when they uh, they they will say we are not a democracy. We're a participatory republic, and that is somebody who doesn't want democracy. So a lot of this, this, this is is reflection, and and the echo chambers that were created in the wake of the FCC fairness doctrine being destroyed, the birth of conservative radio, not liberal radio, conservative radio, and the birth of uh, social media, which has, if you look at, at most cases, the top most visited pages on social media. Um, uh, are conservative. <laughs> Twitter, uh, Facebook, especially on Instagram and TikTok, it's different. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that there's a number one political outlet on that side. Um, so, um, where do you where do you peg TikTok while you're laying out the list? Yeah, I mean, TikTok is this interesting uh, way station of of um, yeah, it's it's to me, it's the purest of the social medias right now because I don't really, think, yeah. That's an interesting viewpoint. Now, please say more. I don't, I, I, I don't, I think people give way too much credit to the Chinese government for whatever control they think they have over that platform. Um, ultimately, TikTok is just a good mousetrap. It's the best mousetrap out there. Um, it's a great uh, like hip, hip hypnosis device. Um, and yeah, is there information going somewhere? But like, yeah, okay. But I, it's, it's, it's always been going somewhere. <laughs> So yeah, uh, so but I don't I do think uh, and I've been banned on TikTok numerous times. So it which I find you were uh, banned on the purest algorithm of them all. <laughs> yeah, because the, the 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 it's the it the users real the the users complaints seem to matter the most on TikTok, and so it is it is always about the safety of the users uh, there. Um, I find um, uh, TikTok. Uh, I'm sorry, t Twitter to be completely moderated. Um, you know, LinkedIn uh, is, uh, I actually feel pretty free there, but as far as meta goes, um, you know, I just feel like it's an absolutely game system towards one specific, um, you know, thing, which is hate. So uh, I just Whereas on call TikTok, out on yeah. TikTok, I do not get that. I do not feel like it's, it's oriented towards my worst self. I, I feel it's much more oriented towards my tastes and my interests. As of so, I, I just want to describe for for most people who are going to be listening to this versus viewing it. So, if you're on YouTube, you can actually see uh, the graph on Americans Trust in Media, and what you see is it was all it was a lot higher uh, in the uh, early '70s, and as Evan noted, there's this pop in 1976 where it goes to 72%. What's kind of interesting about that is media actually produced a movie, All the President's Men, which was actually 
showing media doing its job, which is holding power to account. And that seems to be when people trusted it most. Now, if you look at where it is today, or at least in 2023, the end of 2023, we're down to 32%. So 72% down to 32%. This is, uh, and it's, yes, there's a little bit of ups and downs along the way, but it's a pretty steady decline. So Evan, one of the key questions here that I have is what happens if we keep going on this track? What does the world look like 10 years from today, 20 years from today? What happens next? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, if we, if we continue on this line, um, there will continue to be two versions of the truth in the United States, at least two, if not many more. And, and how does yeah and in but in in fit, like our physical space in our real worlds what is that how does that play out do we have a government do we ever yeah, trust an election do we ex ever accept an outcome of an election what happens I think I mean I do think uh, January six was a breaking point um, but I do think we're headed towards uh, an even larger one um, I don't know what that looks like um, I do think there are numerous outcomes. Um, potentially here. Let's say um, there is a television televised trial of Donald Trump um, where there is a major aha moment that and and there's one of those things like the OJ trial. Um, and yes, they de they de definitely deserve direct comparison um, where the entire country would watch it once. And you could see something happening around that. There's a there's a chance that um, either Joe Biden or Donald Trump does something on a debate stage that changes the courses of history. Um, you know, in the last three years, the mo in the top most 100 watched 100 100 broadcast each year, the State of the Union is always in that top 100. And so people give a shit now more than ever, by the way. Um, you're also coming to a major demographic shift. Um, um, so the, the number one threat, um, in, in the United States, uh, in, uh, 19, like 70, uh, like let's call it 1919 was, uh, the methane gas in cities from horse manure. And then we solved that by accident by inventing <laughs> a car. Um, so, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the demographics of this country will catch up to itself. Um, the abortion issue, I believe, is one of those events um, that could conceivably shift things. Um, you know, so not in trust in media, but shift the political landscape, realign it in such a form where other changes might come into play, where you might see the 230 um, uh, uh, rule from the uh, um, uh, from the uh, Internet Act. Um, be rescinded, and suddenly platforms are responsible for beheadings and other misinformation that's being uh, trafficked on their platforms. That would greatly change uh, well, this landscape. I, I would argue it, it would change it dramatically quickly. Um, I think if cable companies were uh, equal to equally liable to Fox Corporation in the Smartmatic, and uh, what was the other one? Dominion. Uh, Dominion voting. So if, if if they were facing three billion, their own version of a three billion dollar lawsuit, Comcast and Charter and Directv and Verizon and Cox and Altice, uh, were all facing the same exact lawsuit that Fox was, because they were responsible for what was being carried on their airwaves. We would see different things on air. So what you're and, and just to spell it out for folks that may be less familiar with Section 230 in and, and Evan, correct me if I'm not saying this right. But my understanding is there's there's accountability financially where you can be sued on a platform if there's no 230. But right now they've got this protection that may have made sense when they came up with it a few I'll, decades I'm ago. We we're you, living on a different I'm, planet. I'll, I'll give you the perfect case study because uh, the, the Smartmatic one, I think, is a good one, but it's an extension to think that Section 230 would extend to MVPD, to cable. Let's go to the internet, which is really where Section 230 applies. Although, to be blunt, uh, Fox News is carried on YouTube TV on Hulu Live, on digital versions 
of of cable that would be governed by Section 230, I believe. But let's flip it around. You know who Alex Jones is, right? Yep. So we Alex talk about Jones, him often. Alex Jones, who's still considered a hero in 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 certain uh, conservative circles, lied about to make money in order to make money. Let's be clear. Lied about uh, children being crisis actors at Sandy Hook. Right. I think they were five years old, and I think there were thirty killed or something like that. And then so harassed the families that they all had to move out of their houses and and call them. They sued the family sued Jones for one point. I think they won for one point five billion dollars, right? Yeah, right. And, and he's fighting that because he's the worst human who's ever lived. However, how did these? How did people find Alex Jones? YouTube, Twitter, these same platforms. So in this case specifically, where one point five billion dollars in damages were were found for someone who distributed their bullshit fraud about families who lost their children to a mass shooter. Um, he was sued and lost. The platforms would be equally responsible. And so they would not have allowed him to say these things in the first place because they're false. Not because we don't like them, because they're untrue and they're harmful to specific human beings. So we need to create a bulwark against that kind of horrific attack. Um, and we have nothing right now. There is absolutely nothing to protect our society or our children for that matter um, from this type of, of bullshit for profit bullshit. So it's not just some lunatic spouting off. It's not, it's not Charles Manson or David Koresh. Those are terrible people too, but they were fucking nuts, right? They weren't in it for the money. The the Alex Joneses and and those types of folks who are able to 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 manipulate people over the internet with false information for their own enrichment should be able to be shut down from society. And we don't have any. We used to. I, I want to talk about um, social media because I mean this just came across my desk. It's new. It's YouGov research that I mean for eighteen percent of people social media is their primary source of news media. And that's up from 12% in 2019. At the same time, TV dropped from 31% to 25% as the primary source. So you can see see where things are trending, right? And that's that's among everybody. That's not a that that's not saying what is your primary source for people under 45, <laughs> which right, you can probably right. guess. Who's, was that Pew? This was this is YouGov. Yeah, research. yeah. I mean, if you Pew just did a big study that breaks it down by by demographic. I also wrote about that um, because there's this hysteria born out of oh, kids are getting their information about uh, the Israeli Gaza uh, uh, conflict on TikTok. Okay, they are, but relatively fewer P uh, Gen Zers are getting their information about Israel and Gaza on TikTok than 50 year olds getting their information about Israel and Gaza on Facebook. What What is the primary place that the younger folks are getting it? Uh, more people under the age of 34 get their news from Instagram and and uh, and and Facebook, frankly, and YouTube is much bigger, way bigger uh, than get it from TikTok. Um, TikTok is big, but it's it, and it's growing, especially for very for much younger people. But when you you look at the overall percentage of consumers in different demographics who get their news from different social media as a primary source of it, of, of of information, um, I believe the largest pool is amongst like that thirty five to fifty crowd and Facebook. <laughs> so like, let's all you know, and that there's as much misinformation on on Facebook um, as there is on TikTok. Right, it's just that the misinformation on Facebook agrees with what the people who are whining about the kids on TikTok want to want to hear in on the on this thing. So there, it, you know, the 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 echo chambers exist everywhere: Twitter, uh, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, um, um, and they're deep, and they're and they're getting more impenetrable on a day to day basis. But I. I don't see TikTok as the major threat uh, as much as I see social media as the, the major threat. So, so uh, I, yeah, I was going to just pick up. Um, so 
it's it's pretty clear that social media is becoming more and more important as our source of information or source of news media. Um, I think there's two things related to that. Okay, we're getting our news and kind of you start to get into your own echo chamber. You follow the things that you like and you may not listen to other perspectives. The other thing I'm interested in your perspective on, by the fact that it's on Facebook or it's on Instagram, does that lend credibility to it as being authentic? So so the platforms don't have responsibility for what's on their what's what's shared on their platform but there by virtue of it being shared on that platform does it make it more credible to consumers it's a uh, credibility is in the eyes of the beholder so it really depends i mean it's uh, and and you can slice it and, and that's that that's kind of one of the um i think major shifts that we have to focus on on a moving forward basis is the definition of the relationship between the consumer of information and the provider of information is completely different than it used to be. And um, the user at this is at the center of it. You know, I use social media for, for, for my news, but I program it with news organizations. For me, those are all credible. Uh, I know young people who who populate their news feeds with Joe Rogan and <laughs> call her dad. Like that's their news feed. So yes, each person chooses the news sources. The, 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 what I have found, by the way, about the surveys, it's very much like the, the survey you might do around Congress. So people hate Congress. They just hate it. And yet Congress has a 95% uh, incumbent reelection rate. Yeah, it's a perfect metaphor. It's exactly what's happening. So they they hate Congress, but they love their congressperson. In this case, people hate the media, but they love Joe Rogan, or they love Rachel Maddow, or they love the New York Times, or they love you know New York Post, or whatever whoever is their source of of news. So it's that is the 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 issue here is there are a thousand different points of sort sources of truth, and everybody believes theirs is 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 right. And only some actually are. Evan, um, I know we're talking about media and trust in media, but you've seen the Edelman reports. You've seen that there's not just a decline in trust in media, but all these other institutions. And may maybe it's just me being narcissistic to think, of course, it's all about us because we're in media. But how much of a correlation do you see between the decline of trust in media and trust in those other institutions? Is it art imitating life, uh, life imitating art? Is that propelling it, or do you see those as separate causes? The 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 same people who created the ecosystem that separates us, and the same group of people who profit off of the separation, um, are the same ones who are experts at using the media to destroy. I mean, this is this is well, I'll, I won't get there yet. I'll get there in a second. Um, they're they're experts in using the media to destroy our belief in our institutions, and we this is not a new thing. This is this is a repeated cycle in our culture, and that when the very few want to want to run things for the very many, which is exactly the point in history we're at right now, a very small selection of people think they know best for everybody else, and they're very good at at, at convincing those they most want to control to listen to only them and not anything else. And it is, it is, it is demonstrated here and we're going to see it play out in an election. So it sounds like if we think about, all right, so where do we go from here and like, what are the possible solutions? It sounds like you're an advocate for the repeal of section two thirty and allowing hundred percent. So, but let's play that forward a little bit. I, the upsides, I think, are are pretty clear. You do away with a lot of the misinformation, a lot of the, um, you know, the filter bubbles, and and people have to have some unified version of information that has accountability, right? And that's all positive. It should be. Wait, let me just be. Let's let's note every part of the the law of which Section two thirty is a part was repealed except Section two thirty. So let's just uh, let's start there and, and we yeah. can go from there. 
Well, so is it as clean as just getting rid of that part or? No, I think like, what, to... I'm trying to figure out what happens to social media, what happens to speech, what happens to user generated content? Do we as users no longer get to speak freely because we feel we may get uh, sued as well? What how, how does how do you do this in real life? How, or how how much of that is you just playing devil's advocate and how much of you are seriously asking that question? I'm just curious. well, I, um, I am seriously asking the question because I I because there's a direct comp, right? So we yeah. can't use music we don't own in our stuff for profit on yeah. YouTube. It immediately right. takes it down. Okay, so so the delineation might be if you're making money on it then you have accountability but if you're well, just I think I think if it's, not... it, I think if there is a way to discern fraudulent con misinformation obviously yeah. today we may not have an algorithm for that and it is a yeah. dangerous concept to design gen ai that would be on the hunt for that sounds very minority report um but on the flip side you know do you, each of you have a a a, a smartphone yes do each yes. of you have a banking app on that smartphone yep yes did either of you read the terms and conditions of the banking app before you? Of course not. <laughs> Have you had any fraud on your banking app? Not yet. Right. Why can we do that? But we can't do this. We can. We can. I know we can. I don't know how to do it. I'm not a technologist. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a designer. I'm not a coder. But I know we can. It's just that we don't want to. We could root out all the fraud in in the ad in the digital ad business if we want to. We just don't want to because there's a lot of people profiting off of it right now. Yeah. So so I do believe there's a way to to construct a new fairness doctrine to cover broadcast media, uh, repeal two thirty and replace it with a sensible set of rules of responsibility around the trafficking of intellectual property. Marry these two things together, but it's going to take us getting to the other side of that critical moment, I think, unfortunately, like we're gonna, things are gonna have to really break. And then, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like the uh, the reconciliation conference in South Africa after apartheid yeah. revealed, yes. we're gonna have yes. to get together and root out how to reconstruct our, our shared universal fountain of truth um, that we all need, by the way, this works in England. This, in England is fucked up too. Don't get me wrong, but the, the the Europe's trust in their media, therefore the strengths of their democracies, is so much higher than it is here in the United States because of the way they run it. Specifically, it's not they do news different. It's that the whole system is different, and I think that's an, an important lesson. And so to make that big a leap, yeah, yeah, I think unfortunately something big is going to have to break again. Yeah, well, so this is really, really fascinating because we, we, you and I have never spoken before, and um, and I, I'm sure you haven't been a serial listener to the Media Roundtable podcast, but we've been trying to grapple with the same issue, and I've landed on a on a slightly different conclusion, frankly, because I don't know if I trust the government to actually like I don't know that there's actually a pathway to get that they can solve anything because there's too much profit and too much job security in them not doing anything to fix anything sure. right yeah. and so so I'll tell you where 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 I've landed from doing I mean literally we did 2 years of interviews just trying to get different perspectives on this issue like how do we put Humpty Dumpty back together and I I think where I landed and I think it's affecting a lot of what we do through this organization is I think I think a financial uh, consequence is correct, but the only thing that I can think of that we can and and I think this is something in our job that we can actually do something about is that there need to be nutrition labels on media yeah. so that brands can behave responsibly and and change the incentive structure because all the incentive structures favored division and sensationalism. Yeah. And Still. if we can shift the carrot over so that brands know they're held accountable, but they have the tools and the ability to actually weed through this stuff, then we can actually work with brands who, and you know, you look at the other, the, the only institution that anybody trusts anymore is small business, but it, but right. it, it is small business that is powering all these ad supported platforms. And so if we can shift the incentive structure for them, we can shift the outcomes in media and then we can shift the outcomes in culture. So I, you know, I've been trying, like, I wish 230 had a solve. 
I don't know where it's going to come from, and I've just not heard of any. Well, two thirty, two thirty is a solve because it, it it is such a financial disincentive, right? Platforms, right? Um, and I don't think it's fair to put everything on the advertisers either, because like they don't necessarily all have the the capability. If they did, they wouldn't suffer through so much fraud from Meta and, and right and Google. Well, and we don't want them to be penalized. I mean, for heaven's sakes, right. we work for them. That's who, right, you know, exactly. that, that's what powers our business. But what we, we, you know, in 2020, when we came into this, just using podcast as an open ecosystem, as a metaphor, there was nothing. Everybody was totally flying blind and their decisions about what to sponsor and what to restrict were completely arbitrary. So we've been involved in helping launch three different brand safety and suitability tools, really just trying to get them more at reliable information about the what's inside of the content that they're supporting. But, you know, it's we're all trying to solve the same problem, I think, and it's really interesting to hear where we're landing on it. Um, any holes you want to poke in that thesis? That, that the re reorienting the financial incentive. I mean, the, the thing is, is that you still have to you still have to accomplish your marketing goals, right? So yeah. if, you, if, you're, if you're if you're if you're saying we're going to hold you accountable in a different way, and we're always going to point you to this much higher quality content, from yeah, a, from a pure kind of truth and 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 veritability standpoint, that's great. But if no one listens to it, they're not going to do that. So, um, so I do think you have to 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 figure out a, a method by which. They're protected. You're advertising. You're protecting the advertisers from finding their stuff in stuff that they don't want to be in, which is our job anyway, isn't it? Like, isn't it, it part of it, our it our, our responsibility? Aren't they paying us to keep them out of missing? Like, forget beheadings and violence and things right, that are right, right. clearly wrong, because um, it did get taken down. But but um, but the stuff that just is like, how does you think an advertiser feels now about the two years they spent next to Alex Jones? <laughs> But, you know, even if they did support him theoretically, they're like, well, maybe that's not an association we want anymore. So I do think if we can build, I think financial incentives for the platforms to stay away from this content, um, monitoring tools that are not necessarily left to human decision, that they are yes. driven by machine learning, um, that decelerates hate, um, that the system is disincentivized around hate and misinformation. If the whole system gets get if we all share data to ensure yeah. that hate is not the number one priority that we're not rewarding division and hate that's a hard thing to agree on though don't you think uh, very hard and we've been in the middle of it and so you know we started working with the media bias chart and just bringing that to podcasts which you probably right, seen right, but right, like right. we're we're a little short on cartographers in this business <laughs> as you as you know and are exploiting the vulnerability in the system um no but very seriously um, GARM is right now the, the, the rule people are trying to use. And what happens is when you try to take where machine learning is at today and apply that to GARM, you basically, if you try to be as cautious as you'd like to be and make your brand values line up with your, Nothing, your right. ad buys, you can't buy anything, right? Nothing is sponsorable. One of the things we just released last year with a group called Seeker, which is a tech platform, is something called the Civility Score. And hmm. all that measures, it's not about the nouns. It's about how many personal attacks are you making? What is the concentration and severity of your personal attacks? But that's part and of the fairness doctrine. Like personal attacks were, were literally defined with, uh, within a governance of the fairness. Which was awesome when they had it, but I don't yeah, know, I know how to get that back. So we're just trying to come at it from the oh, that's right great. marketplace. And we're trying to say like, look, if we just show an advertiser, this is how venomous they are. Like, can you make your point without attacking and making somebody well, else do you do you measure the potential brand damage that a that a proximity like that could, could potentially engender um can you you probably could do we know and do you need to i don't know because i kind of feel like it's self-evident no yeah the, the, i mean ultimately here's the thing um dan and you um I believe I'm on this kind of uh, crusade of 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 a of a like to to push data out into the world. Um, yes, because I do believe that data is the thing that can improve this whole ecosystem, both yeah. from an economic standpoint, solving the model problem that that everybody in entertainment and media and technology is having right now. Thirty four thousand layoffs in the first quarter of 2024, just so far. 
it's only middle of February. Um, uh, but also the user experience. And mm -hmm. so if, if all of the major information platforms, let's leave Google and Meta and even Amazon out of it because their data is their oil, right? Mm -hmm. but if you took all the other players out there um, and even the non-social media platforms, just the publishers and the brands and the, the, the news organizations and all that kind of stuff. And everybody pulled their first party data and created one source of information from humans. And then we created universal IDs off of that for each one of our users that allowed them to navigate the universe and have it be personalized to them as they went, but also that protected them from misinformation and protected them from their identities being stolen kind of a, as a two-way thing. Yeah. That's all data-based and that's a lot of work. And that's the work I believe we as an ecosystem need to be doing right now. But it, it whatever that utopia I'm dreaming of starts with, it yeah. does start with all of us really pooling our data to find the right answers. That's the, that's, what's going to get us there. Uh, we're, we're quickly coming up on time. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk just very briefly about is, I mean, we, a lot of what we do at Oxford Road is related to podcasts and study after study shows like the trust that people have in the podcast yeah. and podcasts. Funny, isn't it? Right. So that's what, you know, it's a thing that's near and dear to our hearts right. and we want to, you know, continue to kind of really protect because there aren't a lot of places that people trust anymore. Like, do you have a perspective, like what can podcasting do in, in maybe just a minute um, and then we'll just wrap it up? Um, well, well, I think I think there's two, three major reasons and they all kind of tie to the same thing that podcasting ha continues. And it's not just trust, it's also efficacy. Ads inside podcasts yeah. seem yeah, to yeah. be more effective than most other ads out there. Um, Which they are. And, yeah. And, and they're also measurable more. There's more care in how they're measured. So they're, yep. I do think those things are correlated. Um, the, 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 the main component though is the intimacy. I just think it's a very intimate art. Um, and so the, I think you can't, I think that is very effective. I'm not really sure how to replicate that, but I also think radio has a lot of that same, um, you know, especially when you go back to the big days the Howard Stearns of it all. Right. Yeah. Ryan Seacrest. Um, the, the um, second thing is it, it goes back to the fragmentation and the upside of it. People who listen to podcasts for the most part, and there are there are exceptions to this, but even some the largest podcasts in the world, Joe Rogan, it's a niche. It mm -hmm. feels, even though it's a big audience, feels very specialized to me. And most podcasts have much smaller audiences. So they are very much a community and they all tend to get together a lot too. So it's, it, there is an invest, there's an emotional investment in a community there that's different than it is with reading the New York Times or even watching Rachel, you know what I mean? It's a little bit different. Um, the art form kind of beg, um, begs for that. So that nichification really has helped, I think, the trust um, there. Um, and then I just think the, um, the fact that there are just, um, you know, it's it's it it doesn't feel as commercial an environment. Um, there are fewer ad breaks. There are fewer ads. It is not gunked up. There's not a breaking sign going at the bottom of it. Um, so you know this is a relationship I have with this one individual. It's a very good environment that feels even if it's not catered to me. Um, and there are more than one touch points usually um, with the with it. So the level of engagement is substantially higher. And this goes to a universal truth I think is is really crucial in the user centric era, which is community is better than audience. It's not about the width, it's about the depth. Sell love, transact on emotion, track to transact on engagement. Um, cults are really good businesses. Um, and so, you know, really the, 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 the engagement of your community is I think more important than the size of your audience. Uh, that's great. Evan, uh, you've been very generous with your time. I hope this is the first part in a, uh, long-term conversation love that. This that we're is a having. Great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're, we're working on the same problems from different angles. So thank you for what you're doing. Hey, if people want to follow you, want to get involved, um, wh where do you point them? Cause you got so many places. Actually don't, I did limit it down. Uh, so uh, eshap.tv is where you can find all my stuff. 
Um, but LinkedIn is where I write every single day. And Media War and Peace is my newsletter. If if you Google Media War and Peace, chances are it'll come up. Well, and, thank you very much. And you should subscribe. If oh, if thanks. you're if you're in the marketing industry, it's an amazing read. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, this podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and use your influence for good. As members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify and to build bridges across differences and preserve fair-minded discussion around the most important topics of our age. If you're a marketer, and you want to align your brand values with extraordinary business outcomes, well, maybe reach out to our agency, Oxford Road. Go to OxfordRoad.com. Subscribe to our newsletter, The Influencer, and we'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback, info at MediaRoundTable.com. Uh, thank you uh, to Evan, uh, to Neil, to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, Scott, Mary Jane Everett, and the team at Podcast One. And as always, influence responsibly. <laughs>